Good evening, everyone. My name is Carolyn Brown, and I am the Senior Associate Director of Development and Community Engagement at Penn Medicine's Basser Center for BRCA. On behalf of the Basser Center's Young Leadership Council, I would like to welcome you to tonight's panel discussion, Mastectomy Reconstruction. The Basser Center's Young Leadership Council is a dynamic group of 133 men and women in 29 states, Australia, and Canada who are volunteers and supporters of the Basser Center, passionate about changing the options that currently exist for BRCA mutation carriers for generations to come. The opinions and experiences shared tonight are the panelists' own and do not represent those of the Basser Center, its Young Leadership Council, or Penn Medicine. You should consult with your healthcare team should you have any questions about the specifics of your health and medical plan. Thank you to our panelists for joining us this evening for this important discussion about mastectomy reconstruction, including types of implants, uh, reconstruction techniques, and more. Jenny Soren, who will be moderating our panel this evening, is a documentary producer and consultant based in New York City. Her work has been featured across major networks, including PBS, HBO, and MSNBC. In 2018, Jenny learned that she carried a BRCA1 mutation and elected to undergo a prophylactic double mastectomy followed by reconstruction. Jenny is a dedicated member of the YLC and serves as a co-chair for the YLC's event committee. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jenny. Carolyn, thank you so much for that introduction and um, thank you all for being here. Um, and with that said, I'd like to get tonight started by introducing our esteemed panelists. So Maura Morris, say hi. Um, Maura is a CPA who spent a decade in public accounting and recently left to pursue a career in interior design. She resides in Philadelphia with her husband, Brian. Maura learned she had a BRCA1 mutation in 2014 and had a prophylactic double mastectomy with reconstruction at Penn Medicine in August of 2020. Katrina Wells, hi Katrina. Katrina Wells is an editor at a healthcare publishing company in South Jersey where she lives with her husband, her three daughters and her two dogs. Katrina found out about her BRCA1 mutation in 2013 and since then has undergone direct to implant surgery with two revisions due to capsular contracture. She recently underwent a deep flap surgery as well. And finally, Dr. Liza Wu. Dr. Wu is a board certified plastic and reconstruction surgeon at Penn Medicine. Her clinical practice involves both the surgical management of breast cancer as well as reconstruction using her skills as a microsurgeon. As a result, her clinical expertise at Penn Medicine has become internationally recognized with hundreds of publications, invited lectures, and professional accolades. Thank you all for agreeing to share your knowledge and expertise with us this evening and for just being so open with your stories. So let's get started. Um, Dr. Wu, can you briefly explain what are the different types of reconstruction surgeries available to patients who are undergoing a mastectomy? Um, you know, flats, flaps, implants, over the muscle, under the muscle, there's just a lot of knowledge um, that you have to intake at once. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of the panel. And thank you very much for all of you who are logged in to hear a little bit more about mastectomy and its reconstruction. Um, so this conversation normally can take easily an hour. I'm just gonna give a brief overview. Um, and then of course, if anybody had any questions, they can reach out, make an appointment um, to see me or any one of my colleagues. Uh, and I'm happy to go over these options again. So as Jenny had mentioned, uh, you do have multiple options after mastectomy. You can uh, essentially go flat or uh, go without reconstruction. Um, that is always an option. Should that be something you don't choose to do, you can choose to have reconstruction either with implants or using your own tissues or what we call autologous reconstruction. And then there's methods that combine the two in which you would have autologous reconstruction plus implants. 
Implants can be placed on top of the muscle or half under the muscle or completely under the muscle. And it really just depends. Every person is different. Um, so the choices are, are, very, are tailored very much to the individual. There are different types of implants uh, with regards to what they're filled with, either silicone or saline. And believe it or not, there's different shapes to the implants. Again, in each one of these decisions are made with your surgeon, you and your surgeon, um, to tailor it to what you want in the end. With regards to autologous reconstruction or reconstruction using your own tissues, um, you would meet with your surgeon and see if you have enough tissue in the appropriate places in which you can, we can take the tissue and build a breast out of those. Um, most commonly, and the gold standard is the tissue from your lower abdomen, but you can also take tissue from your buttock area or your inner thighs. Those are the most common areas. And again, um, work with your surgeon to see which of these options are the best for you. And that's a very quick, brief overview of the different types of reconstruction or non-reconstruction uh, you can choose to do after a mastectomy. Thank you, Dr. Wu. That was incredibly informative, even though it was a short amount of time. Um, as a follow-up to that question, do implants need to be replaced after a certain amount of time for those who do choose reconstruction? Yes, so one of the biggest um, downsides to implants is that they will all rupture and it's a matter of time. So the rupture rate for the majority of implants are, is 1% per year up until 10 years in which that percentage goes up to about 12 to 16%, just depending on the type of implant that you have. And every year subsequent to that, the, the incidence of implant rupture goes up. Um, so we typically tell women, we hope that your implant will last about 10 to 15 years. Uh, we can monitor for rupture. Um, if you have a saline implant, the saline typically will deflate. If you have a silicone implant, you actually may not know that it ruptures. It's called a silent rupture. Um, most women will exhibit some change to their breasts. Sometimes it goes unnoticed. That's why it's important to have continuous follow-up with your plastic surgeon, even when th you think that things are going well. Um, we can monitor your implant integrity by doing either ultrasound or MRI typically on a regular basis. Uh, and that's what we would recommend. That's a, that's a great point. And to um, keep the relationship with your plastic surgeon, also a really good point. Um, Katrina, I would want to go over to you. Um, given your experience, you initially had direct to implant reconstruction and you recently converted to a flap. Can you share what those surgeries were like and why you decided to make the change? Sure. So I spent about three years planning my first mastectomy and I had this great plan and it was going to be perfect. And I really was looking for the quickest, safest surgery that made me feel like me afterwards from a mental aspect. So um, I did direct to implant. It was under the muscle and everything seemed to go perfectly. It was, I was back at work at week four, drains were out at day six or seven, and it was wonderful. I, I really felt like I had made the best decision. I don't regret the decision that I made, but my body didn't seem very happy with me at about three or four months post-op. Um, I seen, I developed capsular contracture. It seemed higher. It seemed tighter. I called my plastic surgeon. He said it was very rare, but it could happen. So I went up and I saw him and he's like, yeah, that's actually what is going on. So I had two revisions. I tried twice to have the scar tissue scraped out. So capsular contracture, which is what everybody knows, is a buildup of scar tissue around the implant and it becomes tight. It becomes hard. It can become very painful. Mine was never got to the extreme of being super painful, but it was noticeable to me. So we tried, replaced, swapped the implants out, swapped them both out because you don't want two implants that are necessarily different ages, all those sorts of things Dr. Wu mentioned. Um, I had, after the second one, I was like, oh, third time's not gonna be a charm for me. I was like, I'll figure it out later. Um, I ended up with an infection a year after my second revision. And it was enough to, to scare me into like, okay, maybe mentally I'm ready for a bigger step. 
Um, what do I need to do to not have a breast surgery every year for the rest of my life? Because that's what it was feeling like at that point. So fast forward to 2020 and I started doing consults for flap surgeries. And uh, at, during that, you go for like an MRA, you get checked for all your vessels, make sure that you are a candidate for the flap surgery. And they found a suspected rupture. So what I actually ended up doing was explanting in December and being flat for two months. So what my plastic surgeon had anecdotally experienced was if there's a potential rupture, if there's an escape of any of the silicone, that it can hinder your healing when you go forward with the flap surgery. So she suggested, and I agreed that the explant was the right decision for me. That was a harder surgery than I anticipated. And, you know, from what I experienced, Physically, I believe it's because they tacked the muscle back down and because I had all that scar tissue that needed to be cleaned out. So it was a rough, it was only rough for about a week or two. Um, and then once the drains came out, I actually felt so much better. I was amazed. I didn't think that I would feel that much better because it was really not that big of an impact on my life. Um, but I did feel really great after to the point that I questioned going forward with the flap surgery and thought about staying flat. Um, and I just, for my mental health, I thought, I, I think I need to try this. So I had the flap surgery in February and uh, things went really well. I, I'm really happy with the aesthetic outcome. I am, I do feel much better in my chest area. My muscles feel intact. I'm dealing with a little bit of swelling still from the surgery um, and some lingering other small issues. But overall, I'm very happy that I made the decision for me at this point in my life. Um, as my husband put it, you know, you you went from renting to buying and hopefully after everything's done with this flap, everything, it really is a little more settled and I don't have to worry about the kind of consistent follow-up on the implants. Yeah, thank you for sharing all of that and um, glad that you are on the way to feeling a bit better. Um, Dr. Wu, Katrina's story is a perfect example that reconstruction options are not one size fits all. And no matter what you can do in advance to prepare, it's everyone has a different body and is going to respond differently. Um, can you tell us why a plastic surgeon would lean towards one specific type of reconstruction over another, like, you know, I have under the muscle versus over the muscle? Sure. I mean, a lot of it has to do with um, what they feel they can give the best results, to be honest with you. Um, and, and again, it also is tailored to what the patient desires are. Um, so I want to just take, for example, uh, Katrina's story. So when she was first diagnosed with BRC and decided to go down the route of prophylactic mastectomies and reconstruction, she simply wanted something that was straightforward and would get her back to feeling as herself as fast as possible. She probably had lots of things going on in her lives. She may not have had enough extra tissue in her lower abdomen at the time to build her breast using the own, her own tissues. Um, so again, it's kind of shared decision-making. So I would hope it would be <laughs> shared decision-making. So her and her surgeon spoke and, and decided that implant-based reconstruction was, was the best for her. You know, um, and then moving on, clearly that didn't work out. So her other option was autologous tissue and, and she was able, thank goodness, to be able to do that at, at this present time. Um, I have patients who, there are some women who are better candidates for different types of techniques used in implant reconstruction. So as you alluded to, on top of the muscle or below the muscle. And uh, for me, I feel in my hands as my results, uh, half under the muscle and half under something called acellular dermal matrix, um, which is a bio uh, implant, uh, gives me the best aesthetic result for the patient. However, if I have a patient who tells me, listen, Dr. Wu, I want my muscles intact. I um, use them for yoga or aerobics, or I just would prefer not to. I assess what their desires are long-term, if they're small-breasted, if their nipples are in good place, and I feel that I can give them a really nice result on top of the muscle, that's absolutely something I can give them. Um, so again, you, you want to go to a surgeon who 
is able to do these techniques and use the tools that they have learned and trained with to be able to give you the best result that you want. And there's pluses and minuses to both, right? Um, so one, one technique is not necessarily better than the other. And I, just because it's newer, doesn't mean that it's better, but it's just different. And I think it's one may be better for one person versus another person. So. Thank you. Um, Maura, your surgery was fairly recent and you experienced some complications. Um, can you tell us more about your experience and if there's anything you wish you knew going into surgery or questions that you wish you asked your surgeon, such as sure. that Dr. Wu, you know, just, just brought up. Yep. Yep. First of all, thank you so much for having me. Very honored to be with all of you. Um, in terms of my surgery, so last August, I had a prophylactic bilateral nipple sparing direct to implant mastectomy with the implants placed um, over the muscle. Uh, within a few weeks after my first surgery, I developed necrosis, uh, which is when not enough blood flow is reaching your skin. Um, so it was, it was fairly evident, a, you know, a piece, it was only on my left breast and basically my nipple and a, a piece of skin on my left breast was turning completely black and blue and it didn't look good. Um, so it was determined that that skin was dying, you know, not enough blood flow was reaching it, unfortunately. So in early October, my implant was removed. That piece of skin was removed. Um, I went flat for a few months in hopes um, that the skin would heal. During the time I was flat, I developed a seroma, which is um, when fluid can fill up in the cavity of where my implant was and the risks of that. And, and Dr. Ruth, feel free to interrupt me if I'm not explaining any of this perfectly. But the risk of that was that um, I could get an infection from that fluid sitting there. So during that time, I really got to know all my friends at Penn because I was in the doctor's office, you know, two to three times a week for about six weeks draining that fluid out um, in hopes that that would go away naturally. It did not, unfortunately. So then in December, um, my seroma was surgically cut out and I had a left expander placed, um, this time under the muscle because my skin was just not in a place where it could handle um, an over the muscle placement. So um, that surgery went really well. I healed and then I went through the expansion process of my left breast from I, January through March. I went once a week and had uh, fluid placed in my expander to slowly restretch my skin. And then in April, I had my implant placed um, again, this time under the muscle um, because my skin was just still not in a position to have and over the muscle placement. So because that placement was higher up on my left side in order to try and obtain symmetry with my perfect right breast, um, my surgeon uh, performed fat grafting where fat was taken from basically my love handle area and put in on top of my right breast. And then my right implant was lifted a bit. Um, and that surgery went really well. Unfortunately, I'm still a bit asymmetrical, but um, I'm just in a waiting period now to see if that will naturally even out over time. Um, and if it doesn't, it's nice to know um, I will have the option of, perform of going forward with another surgery to potentially move my left implant back over the muscle. Um, but I'll kind of see where things go from there. Um, but I, I will say, even with all the complications, you know, I feel very lucky that all of my complications were truly cosmetic. Of course, they were extremely frustrating. And I thought this would be like a one and done surgery, check the box, look amazing with um, my new breasts. But um, again, I, I just feel so lucky that it wasn't cancer, which was always my biggest fear. Um, but in terms of things that I wish I knew beforehand, um, you know, I'm certainly definitely not an expert, but I, I don't have anything major. Um, you know, I had the benefit of sitting on my BRCA diagnosis for six years. 
So I found out I had the gene mutation in 2014 and I was really hoping to be able to have the surgery after I got married, but before I had children and I'm very lucky I had that option. Um, so in those six years, you know, I lived in three different cities. I was at three different hospitals. I had a genetic counselor at each hospital. I met with surgeons at each hospital. And I feel like I really, really got a comprehensive understanding of the type of surgery that was best for me. Um, and it was also great because by the time I got to Penn, I had met with other surgeons and I felt like I had the perspective to say, yes, this is definitely the right hospital for me. This is the right decision. Um, and one resource that I really used is the website um, called The Previver. So it's a great sort of comprehensive website that explains all of your reconstruction options. Um, and I, I felt that was very helpful. And, and even just seeing the resources that were available in 2014 when I first learned I had mutation through now, it's amazing to see how much um, how much more is available, which is really hopeful for the future. Wow, Dr. Wu, do you have any initial responses to Maura's story? If someone, you know, routine thinks it's gonna be one and done and then it turns into this unfortunate series of events and Maura, as, as positive as you are, I think, I mean, I will certainly validate the frustration for you and you are allowed to be upset and frustrated with your situation. So um, Dr. Wu, do you have any thoughts? I mean, yeah, I'm so sorry that you had to go through all that because, um, you know, yes, you, you're young, you're healthy, thank goodness you didn't have cancer, but it's still very traumatic to lose your breasts. And it's still very traumatic to face complications. So um, again, uh, I'm sorry you had to go through all that. But, but yeah, unfortunately, complications do happen in the best of hands and the best of circumstances. And um, I know this because it also happens to my own patients. You know, when you operate on so many women, unfortunately, things do happen. Um, I think a really good conversation with your surgeon beforehand, uh, knowing kind of what the risks are and the complications are is, a, is very important so that you are prepared in case kind of these things happen, although you always wish it won't happen to you. Um, but expectations I think are very important when you go forward and through something like this. Um, so, so yeah, uh, again, ter terrible set of circumstances, but you seem to be on the other side of it. Um, and, and that's the great thing is most women can get to the other side. So even though you have bumps in the road and complications, um, work with your surgeon or another surgeon or, or somebody that you trust to get you to the other side and, and you can definitely get there. So, um, and, I, and again, when I was discussing the different options for breast reconstruction, I did not get into risks and complications. Uh, again, it's a very lengthy conversation, um, but they're both implants and using your own tissue have different sets of risks and complications so thank you for thank you for clarifying that um so speaking of speaking of being at on the other side um i'd like to talk a little bit about recovery from your surgeries um so first let's go to katrina um have you noticed any change in your ability to, for physical activities? You know, you've, you had a lot of clearly uncomfortable buildup in your breasts and what's that process been like in trying to um, recover and get back into normal daily activities? So when I had implants, it really was hard to do certain things. Um, and more of it was mental. It was, you could feel the muscle reacting out here, but you couldn't feel anything underneath of it. And so even buckling my kids into their car seats, there were certain motions, scooping ice cream. There's just certain things about the way your body moves that it bothers you. I couldn't do push-ups. I had to get used to running again. Like running with implants was very different than, than what I was used to. So when the muscle got tacked back down, I, it felt normal again. 
and you know, I'd gotten used to the implants. Believe me, I it's I didn't didn't cross my mind seventy five percent of the day that I that I I lived that way. But when I did get regain that, it's so different. It's you go to to do things and it's just normal. It's part of your body, and and I don't feel it doesn't feel like it's foreign anymore. And it's been very interesting that way. You know, I already can feel a difference in my chest, but now I have, you know, an abdominal scar and, and some swelling in the abdominal area that I know is going to be, um, you know, a new hurdle and a new physical, you know, thing that I need to get used to and, and work through and find a new normal there. So that'll be interesting. I just started PT, um, for some, it's basically lymphedema, even though it wasn't lymph nodes, you know, of the arm that most of us who have been around cancer our whole lives are used to that idea of the lymphedema of the arms, it's lymphedema of the abdomen, because by by doing these surgeries and by having these different things, we've just kind of messed with the lymphatic system of our body. So I'm looking forward to, you know, taking those next steps in recovery, but I do feel better now without the implants. And that's just been my experience. Um, yeah, I think everyone has a very different experience. Um, I had my um, uh, expanders in, as I told you guys on our earlier call for like over a year and a half. And to some women that just sounds crazy. But for me, like you, Katrina, I felt totally comfortable, um, which is weird. Um, Maura, anything on your end, any change in your ability to participate in physical activities and just daily life? buckling a seatbelt, taking a dish out of the dishwasher, all of that stuff. Yeah, luckily so far, um, I mean, a large part of the past year, I wasn't able to work out because of all the complications I had. Oh, darn. But um, now that I'm getting back in shape, so far, so good for me. But I will say, um, you know, after the surgeries, it definitely felt very odd. I had a lot of um, nerve pain. Like if I was showering and washing my hair or reaching for something, I could feel like a nerve moving and that was very odd. But luckily I had that after a few of the surgeries that went away um, very easily or within a few weeks, I should say. And then my expander I thought was really painful. I, I commend you for being so comfortable in yours, but my body did not. At first it was fine, but the last few expansions, um, that was pretty rough. So it was definitely a relief. I was, I was ready to get that out of me. I'm a big stomach sleeper. So it felt like I was sleeping on a rock all the time and I just couldn't get a good night's sleep. But, um, you know, luckily I only had that in for, I guess about three months and it was, it was only bad towards the end. And, how, and what kind of workouts have you been able to do since, since your most recent surgery? Like, have you done the stuff that you could do before? Or have you had to totally change? I started slowly just doing things I did before. So I'm really into running and I, I actually find it easier to run with my implants because, um, I always had to wear, you know, such a supportive sports bra before. And now I feel like I can just wear like a lighter, more comfortable bra. And it's really, um, the only time I wear a bra now is when I'm working out. Um, and then I started like cycling classes on the Peloton and very, very light weightlifting. You know, I'll be interested to see given my muscle is over my implant on the left side. Like it's very obvious. You can definitely see your muscle flexing. It's kind of a weird sensation at first because on the right side you know you don't see anything so I have yet to attempt push-ups but we'll see as I get back in shape um, what what comes of it but I, I will say with my experience at Penn immediately after my first surgery um, a physical therapist came right out to my house um, three or four different times and kind of warned me of what I should be on the lookout for and what types of exercises I should be doing. So it was kind of nice that I had that on my radar from day one, basically. Yeah, that's, that's amazing and, and very fortunate. And obviously, you know, you're with experts at, at Penn Medicine. Um, you know, I personally felt like I could have used 
more knowledge around and more push towards the physical therapy space in addition to the mental therapy space i think um you know those are two things where you know it's the it's the build up of the surgery and and then the surgery event in and of itself and then the other things kind of just fall to the wayside and yet it is such a big surgery and it is a really big deal and to kind of ignore um the physical limitations afterwards um i think can be a detriment and for me personally i um am about a year out from my um for my exchange surgery where i had my implants and i've been dealing with a lot of physical pain and limited mobility and um again katrina i agree that a lot of it is mental i think there's a, a big mental component to the pain but um i also think that you know for pre-vivors despite being you know young and thankfully cancer free i think um you know there 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 needs to be more of a of a push toward for those quote unquote young people um into physical therapy after a surgery like this um and for for those on the call or or anyone who is about to undergo a mastectomy um it's something that i i would personally look into um and dr wu i'd, I'd love to know your thoughts on uh, you know managing post-surgical recommendations with the understanding that every patient is different um and you know as we learn more from as patients come forward about their physical and, and mental limitations after a surgery like this what can we you know kind of encourage people to do to to manage um this kind of big surgery a bit better yeah um, you know what, I, I hear three very, very important points that everybody's brought up. You talk about pain postoperatively, you talk about the physical therapy or physical recovery from surgery, which is different, and then you talk about the emotional, mental recovery after surgery. All th these three things I've heard and are incredibly mm -hmm. important. So um, with regards to pain, uh, what has been, what has, I'm going to be completely honest with you, revolutionized our approach to mastectomy and reconstruction is the use of uh, enhanced recovery protocols in which we give multimodal types of pain medication. Um, gone are the days where we write, you know, a prescription for Percocets and tell you to, you know, take them when you go home, you'll probably last a couple of weeks, et cetera. That doesn't happen anymore. Um, our patients get anti-inflammatory medications, something called gabapentin, um, and, and they're treated in, in tramadol, kind of like a, a relaxant, muscle relaxant kind of pain medication. And, and they're treated in these three, three or four different, and we local medication at the time of the mastectomy uh, with uh, blocks. Um, intraoperatively. And it has been incredibly, incredibly successful. And people return to my office and say, you know, Dr. Wu, I didn't take a single narcotic pain medication after I went home. It's, it's amazing. Free flaps and, and implants. Um, if you have tissue expanders, it's a little different because the pain is, is the pain and discomfort can be ongoing for um, I hope you guys are following me. Uh, the pain and discomfort can be ongoing for a few months. Um, as the tissue expansion process goes on. So that tissue expansion is a little bit different. So the post-operative pain, like I said, we've really been, um, I, I feel made tremendous strides in the last couple of years. So the second thing is the physical recovery after surgery. So for me and my patients, um, this is, is extremely important. So there's a period of time after surgery where we don't let you do anything, right? Don't move your arms, don't exercise, don't lift anything, don't strain yourself. And it's quite a bit of time. And for an active person to be sedentary for six to eight weeks, um, you get debilitated. So uh, many women can recover that easily, uh, the, the kind of like the acute debilitation, um, but then there's lasting effects of cutting muscle, um, cutting nerves, et cetera, et cetera. And for me, it is always after the recovery period. In, uh, af so I, let you, I release you to all your normal activities. And then at the next follow-up visit, which is typically within one month, um, we, I ask you, well, how are you doing? Are you doing everything you did before surgery? 
Um, how is that feeling? Do you have any residual pain? Can you move your arms adequately? And it, you know, with those screening questions, uh, we direct people to physical therapy. And this is for both flaps as well as implant-based reconstruction patients. And you always evaluate the arms, the trunk, the arms mm -hmm. and the trunk area. So, um, and then, and then the mental and emotional recovery. I'll tell you, I think we can do a better job there. I think as surgeons, we rely on you guys to get that emotional um, support through your families or your partners um, and through support groups. Uh, I, I think we could do a better job um, helping patients, especially ones that may not have a very big social circle, um, the, the emotional uh, uh, and mental support that they need through this. Um, I have so many wonderful patients who, after their experience, has have turned into counselors and support group leaders, and it's it's incredible and it's beautiful. And um, we have the information, I th but again, I think we could do a better job helping people find that information. Thank you for your honesty um, in that. And I think that's why I personally feel so grateful to the Basser community and to YLC for having this, this little support group here because you know, to, to be young and to not have cancer and to be our age juggling, you know, whether it's young kids or busy careers, um, it feels like a place where we can come where people understand. And I do think that that element of support is huge in the mental recovery process. Um, so um, speaking of that, that mental recovery process, um, Maura and Katrina, I'd love to ask you what kind of that that was like um, after your, your reconstruction process. And maybe if you want to touch on um, the mental, the mental, um, the mental struggle with being flat for those couple of months as well. Um, if you guys want to um, touch on that and Katrina, I'll go to you first. So I think there was there, obviously for me, there was two kind of different approaches to my mental health with the first one. It really was about the cancer prevention and I grew up with women who had had mastectomies and I didn't want my daughters to be kind of scarred by what I went through. So my ideal was to look the way I did before to the point that my three-year-old at one point looked up at me months after surgery and she saw the underside of my breast. She was like, there's your boo-boos, mommy. Like that to me, I was like, oh, well, that makes me feel better. Like they're not going to be completely scarred by what I went through because they're seeing me as deformed or any of that. So that was a huge hurdle for me the first time around. And then I think going flat, it really became more about my emotional comfort in my own body at that point. I felt like my body was turning against me as all these things that were happening. So going flat was a bit of healing for me. And I really did consider staying flat. I didn't think that I could handle it. I did it in December and, you know, it's very easy to, to work with sweaters and, and, and hoodies and not feel like it's an issue. And I, I found some confidence in, in being flat, but I didn't think that it would be for me, um, very mentally healthy for the long run. And I still was thinking about my kids and, and how that would impact them. But there creeps in that doubt and that, am I just doing this for vanity feelings? And that was a huge, that's a huge thing for me still. Like, what did I do? Am I, am I being ridiculous? Am I putting my family through this? Am I putting through my husband through all this, taking care of me and all this stuff? just to have boobs is that necessary and I, and I know that it's not but then that's a logical thought and then there's the emotional aspect that's like I'm not even 40 yet and I don't want to live uncomfortably either way 
with a lack of confidence for, for one thing or another thing, I want to be able to live my life and to be happy and to, you know, should be that good example for my kids. So it's still, I think it's still a struggle here and there, you know, as, as we go through it. Um, and I have a daughter who's a preteen and first week of lockdown and she gets a breast bud. It's like whole nother roller coaster of emotions. So I think it's, it's rough to, and I don't think it ever stops because you're always going to come across something else, whether it's Mara having children or, you know, my watching my girls grow up, it's, you're just going to have something come up every single time. So I think having that support is really important. Um, so. Thank you. Um, Maura, how about you in terms of, you know, the emotional and, and mental process for you and um, what that was like? Yeah, sure. Um, one thing I did pre-surgery, I started seeing a therapist about, I guess about eight months before my surgery. Um, I'm a very private person. I knew I, I couldn't jump headfirst into a support group. I, I kind of needed a professional to help me learn how to speak about this. You know, it's such a loaded topic, especially for lots of women who have seen their moms or their aunts or their grandmothers go through it. Um, so that was really helpful to me. And then I, I feel like as I got closer to surgery, I was able to build because I learned how to speak about it more openly. I was able to build a support group in, you know, obviously my family already knew, but a bigger support group in my family and my friends. And, um, and then when everything started to go downhill after my surgery, it was, it was sort of nice to have that relationship with a therapist in, in place. And I, I would encourage, you know, any woman um, listening or man to uh, seek therapy or support groups. You know, there, there are so many resources and that was super helpful for me. Um, in terms of my complications, I feel like it took a long time for my emotions to catch up with me because I was just so happy not to have cancer. You know, I had had, when I first found out I had BRCA, I had had a lumpectomy immediately. I had had a, um, scares almost every year since. And so I just kept thinking, oh my gosh, I am going to be so mad at myself if I waited too late to have this surgery. And so I, I think I was just so, I was on cloud nine that I didn't have cancer that when things were going wrong cosmetically, I thought, well, you know, this is whatever, like, this is just a bonus to have a beautiful breasts. Like I shouldn't care about this. Um, Katrina, to what you were saying, like, this is selfish to care about what I look like. And then as these complications kept rolling in, you know, it took me a while to take a step back and say like, hey, I still deserve to look great. You know, I'm 32, I, I haven't, you know, I'm married. I, just because I'm married doesn't mean I don't wanna look super attractive. And, but that took me a while to come to that realization and also not feel superficial thinking that, you know, I think, as women, you know, society and, and the media is constantly showing us that if we care a lot about what we look like, then we're high maintenance or we're, you know, this or we're that. And so it was, it was a difficult realization, but I, I feel like I had such a great support behind me, including my surgeon saying, you know, you should care about this. You should, you should be frustrated with this. Um, so I feel very lucky for that. And in terms of being flat, I, I just feel so lucky it was over the winter. I got creative with my clothes and it was also quarantine. I had nowhere to go. Permanently lived, lived in big sweaters and sweatpants. But um, so yeah, that was sort of, that was my experience. And I, I do feel like, Katrina, to your point, you know, it is an ongoing thing. Like that's something that's never going to completely go away. You know, you're never going to wake up and forget that you have implants and you have all these scars, but um, I think it's important to continue to work on it. And I, I do feel like I am someone on the other side of it. And then I, I, you know, I can say that the, the confidence that I've gained from going through this, I think similar to any traumatic event in anyone's life, you know, to come out on the other side and look in the mirror and say like, 
okay, yeah, like I had one breast for six months and I survived, I'm still here. I can laugh about it and talk about it. And, you know, I got through it. You know, it sounds a lot scarier looking back on it, but when you're in the day to day, um, you know, it kind of just went by fast, but my, my emotions definitely caught up to me and I, I feel, feel like I'm in a good place, but you know, it does take work every day. Yeah. I don't think that, you know, you're behind at all. I think that we kind of, um, come to these realizations about what happened to us. You know, the surgery is a traumatic event in and of itself. And then it's kind of like, you wake up a year later and you're like, Whoa, like, what did I do to myself? Like what, what just happened? And I think that, you know, the physical healing process takes precedence and that's what your mind is focused on. And then by the time a couple months, a year, years later, comes around, you're like, whoa, now it's time to actually process my emotions from this. Um, Dr. Wu, do you have any like thoughts or, or anything around um, the emotional healing piece of it and how we can kind of, um, you know, we're all in good places now, but of course there are gonna be, you know, bumps along the road and, um, you know, just, just dealing with all of that can be a lot. Oh, for sure. So yeah, any woman in this position to make a decision like this takes incredible courage and um, to go through the complications also takes a lot of courage. So I commend you all. And um, yeah, I think just being, being prepared and understanding what it takes to go through something like this and understand that complications do happen, unfortunately. But again, you know, know that your your you and your plastic surgeon and your support group are there to get you through it, and and that yes, you can get to the other side. Most, almost everybody does. Okay, and you do eventually look back and say, "Wow, you know, that was a journey." I've been through a lot, but now I'm on the other side. That's our goal. That's what your doctors want for you. Um, that's obviously what you want for yourself. And um, and just know that, because I think that gives you ultimate hope to, to keep going and to keep persevering. Uh, and, and yeah, you, you should look in the mirror and feel good about yourself. You know, you, you absolutely should. So um, that's kind of, all I really have to say and, 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 uh, you know, support is, is very important, um, either through support groups, a therapist, um, you know, your family, your friends, uh, rely on them through this, this process, because it is a process and it's a lot to take on by yourself, I think. So, um, yeah. That's, that's really great advice. Um, don't take it on all by yourself. Um, build a team around you. And I think that's what all of us have done and what we would encourage anyone going through this position to do is to build a team around you that you trust. And, um, you know, there will, be there will be people there to make those hard decisions alongside you. Um, before we open it up to q and I just wanted to touch on a common refrain that people who undergo, undergo reconstruction surgery um, is that, oh, you don't have to worry about wearing a bra. And you're so lucky you don't have to wear a bra anymore. So Maura and Katrina, what has been your experience? I know you touched on it a little bit in terms of working out and sports bras. But um, did you wear a bra after surgery? Did you not? And then I want to go to Dr. Wu and ask her about that wearing a bra. Does that affect reconstruction over time? And um, so Katrina, what was your um, experience with, with just like a normal everyday bra? Well, because I saved my nipples, I didn't feel comfortable not wearing a bra, but also because of the contracture, I was asymmetrical and very noticeably asymmetrical. So I felt like I, I had to, to, to be comfortable wear a bra. Um, I did really want that experience. I was like, I'd love to just be able to at least wear a backless dress once in a while, but I wasn't comfortable the way that was. Um, when I'm done this, I am, I am hopeful that I will 
be comfortable, you know, at least sometimes going without. But for right now, for me, I, I've still, I'm still wearing one, have always worn one. Shout out to Anna Ono, and who's a Philly based yeah. you know, lingerie designer for post mastectomy wear. I've worn the, I pretty much all of them at some point in my <laughs> crazy journey. So um, it's, it's nice that there are options for us now too. Uh, the Athleta post mastectomy bra is wonderful. Uh, I just think that it's nice that we have options that are both comfortable and flattering. Yeah, agreed. Maura, how about you? Yeah, so, I mean, after surgery, I obviously wore the compression bra during healing. Um, and originally, I, you know, I originally had the nipple sparing mastectomy, but with all my complications, uh, my nipples ended up going out the door. So the plus of that is I actually... I only wear a bra when I'm working out or when I'm in a really tight shirt. If I'm in a loose shirt, like the one I have on now, you can't notice my asymmetry. Um, so I, it's a little silver lining. Um, I love not wearing a bra. It's great. <laughs> um, okay. Now, Dr. Wu, how does this scientifically affect us if we choose to wear a bra or not wear a bra? And, um, let me, what are your thoughts? Sure. Um, so I think it's actually a myth that if you have <laughs> based reconstruction, you never have to wear a bra. At least that's what I tell my patients because everybody's very different, right? Because so every, some people have very uh, tissues that um, respond very well and will hold up the reconstruction long-term. And then there's some people whose skin and tissues stretch out over time with the weight of an implant. And, and that's just like normal breasts, to be honest, right? You have friends who have um, perky breasts and then you have friends that don't have perky breasts. Um, I always recommend my patients wear some sort of support, especially during heavy activity like exercise. Um, I also do tell my patients they should not wear underwire in the beginning when they are numb and they can't feel where the wire sits on the side of their breast because you can actually, um, believe it or not, develop a, a, a wound on the side of your breast from the, the ill-fitting bra uh, because you're numb and you don't feel it. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you, there is no science. <laughs> you said, what's the science? Yeah, there is no science behind it, right? Because I'm sure those women who don't have perky breasts at the age of 55 probably wore bra the majority of their lives. So I think a lot of it has to do with personal genetics, a little bit about the, the reconstruction technique, uh, but mostly about genetics. Um, but my recommendation would be to wear support. Um, especially during heavy activity and to make sure that you have a well-fitting bra without underwire, especially if you're numb. If you regain sensation, then I, um, I tell my patients they can wear whatever makes them feel good. So. Thank you. Um, I think with that, we have some time to go to questions from the audience. Um, and I think Carolyn, let's see. Um, so I think we got a couple in advance that I will pull up. Um, oh, here we go. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, okay, so Dr. Wu, this is for you. We've been hearing a lot of nerve preserving mastectomies via DTI. What do you think about this procedure and more widespread to help women with their, with their quality of life? Sure. I, for, so what I think um, the, the question is speaking of is nerve sparing mastectomies. Yeah. Um, sure. I'm happy to field this question. I actually do perform mastectomies myself along with the reconstruction. Uh, so nerve sparing mastectomies are relatively new. Um, what it does is it actually identifies and preserves nerves that come out from the side of your breast, hoping to spare them to reiterate the overlying skin and the nipple areolar complex. Um, you will not have erogenous sensation to the nipple. You will still experience some bit of numbness and the procedure is not 100%. And it is also very difficult to identify the nerve and dissect it out 
is. And then this, the nerve also um, courses not always in the subcutaneous tissue. So it's sometimes it goes within the breast tissue and you certainly don't wanna leave the breast tissue behind. So the, the, the procedure is somewhat experimental, right? Um, it, I do not want anyone to think that it spares all the sensation in your breast and you have erogenous sensation and light touch, soft touch, um, et cetera. Uh, when you have a quote unquote nerve sparing mastectomy. Um, and again, very few people perform it and the people who perform it are the ones who kind of coin the, the, the whole term. Um, again, not possible in, in, in everybody and not necessarily safe in everybody. We, those studies haven't been done. I'm not saying it is safe or isn't safe. I'm saying that studies need to be done. Um, so that is, I think the, what, what the, the question was looking for as, a, as an answer. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, Katrina, can you speak to the abdominal recovery post-surgery someone's asking about? Yeah, I, um, I was lucky enough that my surgeon proactively uses a wound vac on the abdominal incision. So I woke up with the wound vac on and to me, it was very helpful because I didn't have a ton of skin to work with. So it held the incision closed and the wound vac stayed on for a good two, three weeks until the drains came out and then it stayed on for a week after the drains came out from the abdomen. And I was, it was healed like beautifully when they finally did take the, the wound vac off for good. Um, as far as it shouldn't, I shouldn't be affected in my muscles. I did have a slight diastasis recti repair in um, my abdomen from having three kids. So I haven't gotten to that point yet, mainly because I'm dealing with a couple of little lingering things, but I'm hoping that the PT will help with the abdominal uh, recovery as well. Uh, but as far as the incisions and the surgical aspect of it goes, it was not as nearly as big a deal as I thought it was going to be. I was definitely very intimidated by the idea of it. I didn't have C-sections. I had no idea what I was walking into. Um, but thanks to the wound vac and the, you know, the skills of the surgeons, I didn't have nearly any issues with that. And the breasts were still numb when I went through the deep, deep flap. So I had no issues up there either. Um, that's great to hear and, and great for someone to bring up um, with their surgeon if they are going down that road. Um, given we only have um, just a couple minutes left and want to be respectful of everyone's time, um, I would love to end on this question. Um, Dr. Wu, do you think there will be better alternatives for women in the next generation that are positive, that are BRCA positive, other than a bilateral double mastectomy? That is a great question. Um, I would hope that, you know, there are medications that women can take to decrease their risk of, of getting breast cancer if you're um, gene positive and at risk uh, currently. I would hope that that continues to develop so that women don't even need to have the surgery. Um, there's also advances in reconstruction, right? Um, what are those advances? Our implant technology gets better and better every year. I mean, I'm sure everybody remembers or has heard of how implants were taken off the market back in the 1980s. Um, I'm sure everybody has heard of um, the lymphoma that's associated with certain breast implants as well as um, breast implant illness and rupture, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it's so, uh, again, <laughs> again, I'm so sorry, this is not a funny topic. My, my daughters are in the background singing something. Uh, but uh, so there's, there's, there's improvement in that. And then just as the, the previous question was, there, there's gonna be improvement in our techniques, right? We used to take the entire muscle to rebuild a breast when we used your abdominal tissue. We now take nothing no muscle. Um, we do have to cut muscle though. So maybe one day we can suck fat from another part of your battery or grow fat in the laboratory to replace it into your breast. So, so the answer is yes. I, I think there's lots of potential developments in the future that would make this better for, for everybody, um, either prophylactically or um, technically.
Yep, we are all counting on on the medical community in hopes that you know there are all better alternatives in the future. And Katrina, thinking about your daughters and and hopefully you know in the next 20, 30 years, what what they'll have to face looks a lot different than what you had to face. Um, and um, with that being said, I'd like to thank first Maura and Katrina so much for sharing your stories and being so open and so vulnerable with everyone. And I am sure that people will want to follow up with you individually for questions. I know you both um, generously offered to speak with anyone if they had any other questions. So I think Carolyn will pop your emails in the chat. And I just want to say a huge thank you to Dr. Wu for your knowledge, your expertise, your honesty in talking about, you know, some of these topics that not, not every plastic surgeon would be so open and forthcoming with. So um, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. And um, I just feel very lucky to be a part of this great community where we can all garner more more knowledge around this because at the end of the day, knowledge is power. And um, that's what we've all been granted with this surgery and with the brilliance of the doctors. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us. And if there, if I am missing anything else, thank you, Carolyn at the YLC. Um, and I, I hope I'm not missing anyone else, but, but it was just a great event and thank you all for coming.